All right, welcome to week two. Um, today we are going to talk um, about tables and relationships, uh, entities and relationships, um, and attributes and what relationships are. Um, as I said just before I hit the record button, the slide shows a bit of a mess. There's some topics today that really should be next week because it really just goes with next week. And some topics are, multi are repeated a few times, so you'll know when I start skipping things. Okay. There we go. Thank you. But I'll give this group one big point, big, big set of points over with my group from last semester. You mostly all show up on time. Last semester I had this group that show up 20 minutes late for every class. It was stupid. All right. Entities. We're going to start talking about entities. Entities are things that want to be, that are readily identified and that users want to track. And by users we're talking, that could be a person, a company, a department, whatever. It's just someone wants to track certain kinds of information. And we have two common terms. There's the entity class, which is a collection of entities of a given type, um, and an entity instance. Now, one of the fun things about all this terminology is when you talk about an entity class, it is often just called an entity. Rarely do we actually use the word class. It's just an entity, but also known as an entity class. An entity instance, on the other hand, is a thing unto itself. And an entity instance is an occurrence of a particular entity. Um, there's usually many instances of an entity in a class. We will use the simplest example for you guys to understand. The college has an entity called student. It is a piece of information we want to track. Each of you are an instance of a student entity. It's a pretty straightforward concept. Of course, we got doors are closed and they're still out. Um, so that is basically an entity and an instance. Uh, I will be spending a lot more time defining what these things are, but that's the basics of it. So this is an entity called customer. It has a bunch of attributes. Um, basically, attributes are what describes the entity. And we have two instances. So we have an instance of Ajax Manufacturing and an instance of Jones Brothers. The entity defines how an instance is described. Um, if we were to switch this to something else that you guys might recognize, um, CCG, I like card collecting games, you know, Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, Magic the Gathering. Any given game you play of those card games, those addictions, all the cards have very similar attributes, right? If you look at Yu-Gi-Oh, you got the types of cards. You got, you know, monster cards, trap cards, magic cards, whatever. And each of those cards will have certain attributes, you know, number of hit points, activation points, stuff like that. But regardless of what kind of card it is, they all have something in common, and those are their attributes. It doesn't make a difference how many cards you have. They're all defined the same way on the inside. So when we talk about entities, we also have to think about tables. So an entity is a concept is a concept it's a conceptual item the table is a physical item it's also also sometimes called a relation not a relationship a relation i tend to use just the word table because the fact that we have something called a relation and something called a relationship and they're two different things tends to get confusing so i tend to just use the terminology table so an entity at the design concept stage becomes a table in the in the actual database server. Like, so you've got the software running with databases in it and there's tables. Those tables at one point were an entity, they were a concept. Um, this allows it to, allows you to work with the design process 
much more easily because sometimes the relationships aren't are a little nebulous. You're not sure how everything is connected, that kind of thing. I tend to use the example of when you're going to get a, say, a house built, which I fully realize for a lot of people in this room, it's probably a pipe dream at this point with the way the real estate market is. But let's pretend we're all getting a house built. When you get a house built, initially, you're going to say, I want a house. There's my entity. And then I'm going to define some attributes. I want 10 rooms total. No, I didn't say bedrooms. I just said 10 rooms. Later on, those rooms will define their own attributes, you know, bedroom, kitchen, dining room, bathroom, entryway, garage, technically is a room, right? These are instances of rooms, but they technically all have the same properties, you know, width, depth, height, number of doors, number of windows. They all have the same attributes. They just are different things, but they all belong in one thing. But when we're talking about at the initial stage, we're just talking about the house as an entity. It's a nebulous concept that we can quickly adjust and modify. We suddenly realize that we can't afford a house with 10 rooms, so we're gonna make a house with eight rooms. We can make changes quickly with the relationships because we haven't really gotten down to the nuts and bolts of the thing. Then we have, um, this is actually one of the slides that's like repeated three times with three different sets of wording. So I'm going to go over these concepts now and skip them next time we see them. Um, so we have identifiers, candidate keys, and primary keys. And I am going to start with actually the last one on the slide, which is the candidate key. So when we start doing initial design and we are trying to model some pieces of information. We would go and start identifying all the attributes that could be used to uniquely identify an entity. So, sorry, just an itchy nose. So an example of this process would be, okay, let's start defining a student and let's pretend we don't know anything about student numbers yet, okay? So this is Algonquin College, circa 1972. We now need to implement a database for our students because we now have more than like 10 students. We're going to start identifying you know, what makes up a student. So we do stuff like, hey, we're going to collect names, maybe a SIN number, phone number, address, et cetera, et cetera. And at that point in time, we haven't formalized yet on a student number. And Algonquin has like a really interesting history with student numbers. Um, Later, I'll be discussing about some of that specialness. Um, so at, at first, we're going to look at what information we know we have, and we're going to try to pick a candidate key. So it would be one or more of these attributes that make up a student that we'd use to uniquely identify a student. So that's a candidate key. And these are potential ways of identifying someone. So in the 1970s, a SIN number was a really good way to identify someone. Phone number was also a very good way to identify someone in the 1970s. Um, most of you are too young to know this, but it used to be when you moved, your phone number changed. And I don't mean like moving, say, from Capuscasing to North Bay. When I first moved to Ottawa, I lived on Carling right across from Westgate Mall. When I moved to where I'm, when I bought my house and I moved to where I'm at now, my phone number changed. It was Literally two and a half kilometers by as crow flies. But my phone number changed because I was in a different exchange. That's how it worked back then. So phone numbers were normally a very good way to identify someone because they didn't change. You know, how many how many of you have changed cell phone numbers in the last five years? How many of you have had the same phone number but changed providers? There. See, phone numbers mean nothing anymore. I mean, I could use my cell phone here with this number and go up to my hometown, and it still works. After a while, they do trying to get mad at me because I'm not in my home region, but I could use it there for years before they really stopped caring and getting mad enough to charge me money. 
Um, so back then, you know, SIN number would have been a candidate key. Phone number might have been a candidate key. Person's name is never a good candidate key because it's not really unique. So once we've picked our candidate keys and we and we decide, you know, this is the combination that works, it now becomes an identifier. As in, we can identify an instance based on that combination of information. When we take that entity and we change it into an actual database table, it becomes a primary key. The identifier then becomes a primary key. So candidate key and identifier are during the design stage at the beginning, the conceptual stage. Primary key is when you're doing the physical design, what's called the physical design. In other words, you're designing the database for MySQL. You're designing the database for Postgres or for Oracle. That's called physical design. You're designing against a specific target. And eventually the data gets written to the disk, so it's kind of physical, kind of. <clears throat> Attributes. Attributes describe an entity's characteristics. All entity instances of a given entity class or a given entity will have the same attributes, but they'll vary in the values. Um, I am literally going to skip the last two points because I'm actually covering those next week. So when we talk about attributes, we'll go back to students because that's something you should generally understand as a concept, being a student. Attributes of a student would be first name, last name, date of birth, address, phone number, email address. Those are the attributes that describe a student. Uh, uh, you'll, you'll probably also have SIN number if you're a Canadian student. We might have a passport number or a visa number if you're you know, an international student. Um, gender, it's probably still in access. Whether or not they actually collect it anymore is a different question, but it's there. There's all these attributes that define a student. However, obviously, there's what, I have 84 in this group, 85 in this group. I have 85 instances in this group. There's a chance that, to, for example, two people have the same date of birth. Pretty small, but it's happened. There's a chance that I got two people with the same first name. That's happened a lot. I've had people with the same last name. That also happens a lot. I've had people have the same first name and last name. That's happened more than you'd think. But nobody has the same student number. Odds are nobody has the same phone number. That means the data varies. Some of you may have a cell phone number and a home phone number. Some of you may only have a cell phone number. They track both. Actually, Algonquin tracks your home phone number, your cell phone number, your work number. And I think an other which is almost never used, but those are the three that they track. And out of those three, some of you don't have a job, therefore, you know, work number is optional. Not everybody has a home phone number because everybody has a cell phone now, almost nobody has a home phone number. And, or it could be the other way around where you have a home phone number, but you don't have a cell number. I'm not gonna ask anybody to raise their hand if they don't have a cell. But usually in every group, there's one or two still that don't have cells because they just don't see the point. Um, those are attributes, but each instance, in other words, each individual student will have a different set of values for these attributes, but all of you are technically capable of populating all of the attributes. They just have different values. Not having a value still counts as a different value. So not having a home phone number is still a valid value because you don't have one, but you must have at least one phone number. I'm pretty sure the school requires you to have a phone number of some sort. Um, so there, when we looked, we're actually gonna do more of this next week, this diagramming stuff, but there was two styles of way of representing entities and their attributes. The one on the left is the old way of doing it. The one on the right is the new way of doing it. Technically, neither of them is incorrect. I actually prefer the old way because you have an immediate visualization of the difference between an entity and the attributes. On the other one, 
There's just a box with text in it. And the reason why turn on the right, the square box one, is becoming more and more prevalent, because it is becoming more and more prevalent, is that the people that write the software to create ERDs also often create the software to create physical diagrams. Physical diagrams use that layout with some extra crap. So instead of writing two kinds of diagrams and having to handle two different types of diagrams with different rules of how things interact, they said, you know what? We're just gonna make everybody use the box version so we don't need to code it twice. That's all. They took the simplest path to a solution, which is cool, I'm full on for that. But I like the old way better and it's not just because I'm old. I just prefer the style of the old one because I often have to create diagrams for clients that are not tech. And the one on the left is way easier to explain to them than the one on the right. Don't ask me why, but that's been my experience. Um, I always like using the example of how many of you have worked with a manager that's never done your job? Now, there's more in this group than last group. You know exactly what I'm talking about when you need to explain something to them and they have no idea what you're saying, right? And it's like you're speaking a foreign language. You're, you're both speaking English or whatever language you happen to be speaking. You're using words and they're looking at you like you're speaking Martian. The one on the left tends to be easier to explain to people. That's all. That's why I like it. I often have to give diagrams to our OEM, like to our consulting clients, and I always give them that style. Why? Because in 10 seconds, I can explain to them what all the symbols mean. On the one on the right, requires a little more explaining. That's all. Okay, identifiers. Um, I already talked about identifiers. I remember earlier I saw about how some of the slides are repeated. So identifiers I already talked about, it's a way to uniquely identify something. Composite identifiers is something I haven't spoken about yet. A composite identifier is when you have an identifier that's made up of more than one piece. Um, back in the day, in theory, we could have done a composite identifier out of someone's last name and their phone number. The combination of the two was probably going to be unique. Is it a good choice? No, but we could have done that. Um, Identifiers will become keys in the end. I already spoke about that. Now, when we're talking about entities and their attributes, there's three ways of displaying them from left to right, which is an entity with all their attributes, an entity with just the identifier, and then just the entity. The one on the right is the old way of doing it. The one on the left is the new way of doing it. Uh, like I said before, the one on the right is way simpler to explain to someone that's not technically inclined than the one on the left. Next week, we'll be doing talking about diagramming. So I'd rather dive into detail then about this stuff. Um, so in a relational database system, we have tables. Tables are made up of rows and columns. So back to Excel. That's, now, most of you have seen what an Excel spreadsheet looks like by now. And rows are also called records or tuples. You, I'll sometimes use the term record or row interchangeably, because in my brain, they mean the exact same thing. And realistically, they are the exact same thing. You'll never hear me use the phrase tuple. Tuples, the word tuple is usually used by people chasing for extra letters after their name. For those of you that don't know what that means, those are the people trying to get their masters or their PhDs. It's academia and scientific terminology for a tuple is a row. It's also a record. It's all the same thing as tuples is a very technical term to explain that. Columns are also known as attributes or fields. You'll hear me use the word column, see, hear me use the word field interchangeably because they're the exact same thing. Attributes, you won't, when I'm talking about tables, you won't hear me use attributes. That has to do with entities. Um, a column represents categories of data, while rows represent individual instances. Again, when you look at an Excel spreadsheet, the each row goes across. Each column usually contains the exact same kind of information. Each row is a collection of each of all the columns put together. So that's an instance. Uh, so relational databases are structured to store data and have relationships amongst the rows of data. That's the point, it's relational. We have tables, there's relationships between them. 
different instances have different values. Okay. Um, shoot, I forgot. I was going to take the slide up before the start of this class. So back when I ran this course and I had all the lab sections, I used to impose very specific naming conventions, which is these. Everything is lowercase, uses underscores, no camel case. You guys have heard about camel case by now in your programming class, you know, word, uppercase letter, another word, uppercase letter, you know, you separate your words using uppercase letters, that's camel case. I prefer lowercase for everything when it comes inside of a database. Um, and I'll explain to you why. It's just the slide's really in the wrong place for this. Um, the reason I like everything to be lowercase is because different database servers behave with case sensitivity differently. MySQL is the most insensitive database you'll ever use. It gives no shits about what you think you want. It is completely case insensitive. Uppercase, lowercase, it doesn't care, it treats it all the same, which makes it an absolute pain in the butt to work with sometimes when you're trying to make things case sensitive. You actually have to do special things to it. Oracle lies, because that's just what Oracle does. What Oracle does is, let's say you give it a field name or a table name. It will take it exactly the way you wrote it, store it. Then it stores an uppercase version of it also. So whenever you type in like select star from whatever table, it grabs that table name, makes it uppercase, and then it uses that to find the object name. But then it returns it in the, the way you typed it out originally. Oracle lies. It's fine. It's, it's, a, it's just a different way of taking care of the same problem, right? Microsoft SQL Server may or may not be case sensitive, depending what code page you installed it on. For those of you that don't know what code page it is, what code page means, code page means whatever language the operating system is installed in. Installed in English, it's not case sensitive. You, and here's the fun one. You install it on a Cyrillic system, so basically, uh, you know, Ukrainian, Russian, whatever. It's case sensitive. And so an operating system that is not, and the language is not case sensitive. The language is not case sensitive because there's no case. But it's case sensitive when you install it in that. Postgres, which is the database you guys are going to be using in the second half of the semester, is anal retentive about case sensitivity. It is very case sensitive. Why? Because it was written on Unix originally. Unix and Linux are case sensitive. Windows is not. So they made the database engine case sensitive. So in theory, in Postgres, and I think they fixed it in one of some of the newer versions, really doesn't let you do this, but there once was a time where you could put in student, lowercase, and then put in student, uppercase, and then mixed case student actually have three tables called student because it cared about the case. So I, my rule is always just make everything lowercase. That way it's going to work everywhere the same. That's all. That's why here. So we have some alternative terminology here, and there's actually one row missing this, um, which is actually the one that says entity. Um, but often you'll hear, you'll hear somebody use the term table, column, and row. Um, if you're talking university people, they'll use relation attribute tuple. And if you ever interact with someone that worked with databases a long time ago, they'll use file, field, and record. Why would they use file, field, and record? Because the original database servers, each table was a file on the disk. Therefore, it was a file. The file had fields, and it had records. That's why. When I went through school, my first database I used in school was a product called DBase. I expect nobody in this room to ever have heard of DBase. DBase was the best single user database before access. So Microsoft, I know I, I just, just access is just bad, uh, but access came around and killed DBase. On DBase, every time you created a table, it actually created a file. And if you had the right tools, you could actually open the file and actually see each row, each record in each, it was cool. You could actually look at the raw data in each file. So it was a file. Um, now because you can't do that. It's, there's no way to open a database file and actually see what's inside of it. Um, so that's why you'll often hear people use column or field interchangeably or row and record interchangeably.
because realistically the the whatever color that is at the bottom that beige green color became the the orange color when they stopped using you know, individual files for tables the blue one is just university academia and you know data scientists at IBM and stuff okay so here's an example of two um tables student and class um these these pictures are straight out of the textbook i know they're definitely from the 15th edition but they're probably in the 16th edition too i don't know why but they insist on using access to design these tables for examples i guess because it was the easiest you know one to use so you'll have the student number last name first name email so these are the attributes or the columns these this is this would be an instance also known as a row so a collection of all the columns is a single row. And we have two examples of that. These tables are going to come back for a visit later. So relation. And again, this is where um, textbooks like to use certain kinds of terminology. And then you get into the real world and we don't you. Whenever I work with a database, I never go around talking to my coworkers say, so relation A is connected to relation B. I say table A is connected to table B. So, but this is the technical definition of a relation. So an entity is a relation, which is a table. A relation is a two-dimensional table that has the following characteristics. So a table is a relation. It becomes a relation when it follows these rules. Each row contains data about an entity. Cool. Columns contain data about attributes of the entity. Again, cool. All entries in a column are of the same kind. Therefore, if you are prompting for a date of birth, it will only take dates of birth, or at least dates. If you're prompting for last names, it will only take strings, and usually last names. Well, it should be last names. Each column has a unique name. So in a database, you can reuse the same column name in multiple places, but you can never have duplicate column names inside the same table. So a table has attributes or columns. Each of those can only ever have, can only have the name in there once. So we have a table called student. We can only ever have the column called first name in there once. We can have last name in there once. For student, if we have a staff table, we could have first name and last name in there also, but you can never have the same column name twice in the same entity. Cells of a table hold only a single value. In other words, a date of birth for a given record only ever has one date in it. A phone number column only ever has one phone number. A first name will only ever have one value. Notice I use the word value instead of just one name because some people have multiple first names. Mary Ann, Bobby, Joe. Man, those always sound like redneck names. But you know, you got names separated with spaces, names with dashes, you got varying versions of the same name. That's just a value. The order of the columns is unimportant. So in theory, you could have first name, phone number, last name, date of birth, street address, postal code, city, province. It makes no difference what order the columns are in, as long as the values in that column are always the same going down. Normally, when we design, we try to make it make sense so that we'd have first name, last name, date of birth, street address, city, province, postal code, phone number or phone number before the address, whatever. But we try to group the columns together that belong together because visually for a human, when we look at the database structure, we want it to look like that. But the database server gives, doesn't give two shits. Could not care. The order of the rows is unimportant. You can have a row in there where somebody's last name starts with Z before somebody whose name, last name starts with A. Database server doesn't care. It's going to sort it for you. It's going to take care of make sure the data comes out the way you want it to come out when you run the queries against it. Whatever is in there, it does not care. The order of the rows is not important. 
The most important statement in all of this is that last one. No two rows may be identical. Out of all these rules, that's the most important one. Well, all the others are just stating obvious facts. That last one, though, is the important one. Because if you have two identical rows, how are you ever going to know which one you're operating against? Therefore, for it to be a valid relation, you have to be able to uniquely identify every single row. I will use uh, my class of summer 2018 as my example. In that class, I had four Mohammed Mohammeds. All spelt the same way. I had no way to uniquely identify one of those Mohammed Mohammeds if I didn't know their student numbers. At that point, I had there was, I had duplicate rows because there was no way that I uniquely identify them. Once I stick on a student number, then I can uniquely identify which one I was talking to. It got to the point where I just had to call them out by student number. I had like a lookup list of student numbers next to me through my classes with those guys. But the rule is, is no two rows may be identical. Otherwise, we can't. It's not a valid relation because we can't uniquely identify what we're working with. Here's an example of a valid relation. We have columns, also known as you know fields or attributes. We have a single value, and so this is one row. So this is an instance. Each instance has a value for each of these, and there's only one value in each of them. There might be duplicated values going up and down, but each intersection of a row and a column ever has one value. Thus, this is a valid relation because, in theory, we can uniquely find any one of those pieces of information. This is not a valid relation because there's multiple entries in, in some of the cells. Like for employee number 400, we have three phone numbers. So this is saying that there's three values at this intersection. That is not a valid relation because it's breaking one of the rules of only one value per cell, per intersection of column and row, or field and record depending on which terminology you want to use. You'll learn how to fix that later in the term. But this is not valid. This is actually a mess. Keys. All right. A key is a combination of one or more columns that's used to identify a particular row in a table or in a relation. A key is a key that consists of two or more columns. So in theory, if we go back to the example of trying to figure out what would be a good combination of nat of real keys to uniquely identify a student before we gave them student numbers, a composite key could have been last name plus phone number, or last name, first name, and phone number. Because in theory, you could have twins living at the same place with the same last name. So you know, you'd have a combination of columns. That's known as a composite key, where you use multiple values to uniquely identify something. Um, a candidate key is a key that determines all the other columns in a relation. Um, the candidate key becomes an identifier, which then becomes a primary key, um, which is literally what most of the slide says. A primary key is a candidate key that's been selected. Um, there is only one primary key per relation. It doesn't mean that the primary key can't be made up of multiple columns, but they can only ever have one primary key defined per table. Yeah. It depends. So composite keys often happen, um, like next week I'll be talking about strong and weak entities. Composite keys often happen on weak entities. It's an entity that can't be defined by itself and it ends up being defined by things external to itself. And often those will be a composite key. So a good example for that would be a, um, you've got an order and you've got multiple things in your order. So you have something called order lines. Each order line has a product. So each order line, back in the day, nowadays it's not done quite like that, but in the 1970s, 1980s, early 90s, you, your order line would be a combination of the order number and the product number, that would be a combine, a combo key. 
like a, a, a composite key because that it's identified by two pieces of information because it's a weak entity. It can't exist without the other two things. That's normally when you see composite keys. Modern database design tends to, sh to, to avoid composite keys like the plague. We tend to try to avoid it because it's complicated. It makes your code complicated. It makes managing it complicated. Do you notice the word I'm using a lot? When the things are com composite, things get complicated. Um, a primary key may be a single key or a composite key. So, you know, it can be made up of multiple or just a single one. So that's the primary key. Um, I'm actually going to just skip this slide because I'm actually going to readdress this in a bit. So primary key. We've already identified what a primary key is. It's a combination of one or more columns that you need to identify a row. Um, primary keys are important um, because you use it to define your relationships between different tables. When a primary key is chosen and you do it correctly, database lookups tend to be very reliable and pretty fast. Um, here's some hints. There's a typo in this. Uh, here's some hints for good primary keys. Keep it short. Primary keys are used to finding look uh, or literally loose finding records and for matching data from multiple tables. Short primary keys help the database process stuff more quickly. Imagine if your primary key was a combination of a person's first name, last name, and phone number. Every single time you try to find anything, it actually has to compare all three of those columns for every row of data. The longer your primary key is, the more complex your primary key is, the slower it's going to be. We tend to prefer numbers because this might come as a shock to you guys. Computers are good with numbers. Uh, floats are still better than letters, but not by much. Because what you don't realize is in the database, when you put in letters, the computer actually only sees numbers. But each letter is sometimes a series of numbers. For example, um, say CZ, you know, the for those of you that know French and some other languages that use the C with a little tail under it, that is ASCII character 0135. I've had to type French. That's why I know what the code is. I don't have a French keyboard. I'll have to do it. I have to type the codes for all my accents. No, that's uh, that's just standard ASCII. It's going to be the same in UTF-8, as long as you're using a Latinate code page. So the database stores 135. But the problem is that if you go searching for say CZ, it has to do the conversion to the numbers compare the numbers and convert it back. So every time you ask the database server and or the computer to do conversion, it's a bunch of extra work. On the other hand, you say, hey, go get me record 55. It knows, you know, oh, 55 is definitely bigger than 25, so I'm just gonna jump over here and get to that record. Um, later in the semester, we're gonna talk about something called indexes. And I think we're gonna talk about indexes. I don't think they've dropped it yet, but it makes things faster. Numbers are fast. Maintain simplicity. Avoid special characters. Embedded spaces are a mix of upper and lower case. Why? Because it just makes it slower. And you cannot change the primary key after it's been assigned. That's a Once it's assigned, you cannot change it. So way back in the day, one of the most common primary keys that a lot of systems used was SIN numbers, so social insurance numbers. That was a very common primary key. You got hired, the employer would use your SIN number as your primary key. And once was the time Algonquin used that as your primary key, way back in the day. Nowadays, and I never asked directly, if nobody needs to answer this question, but I'm sure people have heard of identity theft. One of the things that happens nowadays when your identity gets stolen is you have to get a new SIN number. If they get a hold of your SIN number and they start using it to, to pretend being you, you can actually cancel your SIN number and get a new SIN number. So now you have to go back everywhere and change your SIN number in all these systems, but you're not allowed to change it because it's a primary key. So when you create a primary key, or you try to pick something that can never, ever change. People's phone numbers change. Can't use a phone number. So 
When you define a primary key, you make sure it's something that won't change. A primary key does not allow duplicates or null values. You can't have the same value twice in a primary key, otherwise you, the row is not unique. Therefore, you can't identify it. And you can't have null values. And this is where I explain what a null is. You will be taught what nulls are in your programming class. But at this point in time, I like to explain what a null is. And I use visual examples to explain a null. OK? Just for you guys know, null is an absence of value. It's not empty. It's an absence of value. See this box. I've defined this box. Do you know what's in it? Therefore, it is null. I open the box. The box is empty. But you know there's a value. It's a value of being empty. This is null because it's not defined what's inside. This is null. They had the toilet paper one, right? No roll. Yep. And then here we have a value, my wallet, magic. Right? So we have a val. There's no value. There is a value because there's something in there. It's empty. That's still a value. An empty string or an empty value is still a value. So you can't have a null in your primary key. Can anybody guess why? Go ahead. No, you can never have a null. Because you don't know what it is. When something is null, it means you don't know. So how can you match to something you don't know what it is? Which, when you guys, I teach you guys SQL after the break. I'll be ranting about nulls again. In Java, you can compare. Is variable A equal to null? Which is the dumbest thing they've ever done in all languages. Java C, they all do it. PHP, Python, they all do it. Is this variable equal to null? You know what's really funny? It's impossible for something to be equal to null. How can something be equal to the absence of value? If there's no value, how can it be equal to something? Anyways, I'll be going over that when during SQL time. But you can't have a null as a primary key because you don't know what it is. Therefore, it can't be identified. If it can't be identified, it's not an identifier. Thus, you can't have nulls. And whenever your Java prof starts talking to you guys about nulls, you'll know all about it already. It's just Java does it a little different, but the concept's the same. A primary key can be defined at the table level or at the column level. I'll actually be revisiting that on week nine. It's just, you can define the primary key in two different places. That's all. Surrogate keys. So, so far we've been talking about natural keys. Whenever we talk about identifiers and candidate keys, those are known as natural keys. And in other words, these are keys based on data that exists, that is there. A surrogate key is known as an artificial column that's added to a table to serve as a primary key. It is a value that is automatically supplied by the database server. There's no programming language involved. You add a row, it gets its value automatically. It's short numeric, and it never changes. It has an artificial value, which is meaningless to users. And normally, it's kind of hidden. I like to compare surrogate keys to something you've all experienced in one way or another. How many of you, say, in the last year, have gone to some government office, some other kind of office, and you had to take a number to wait your turn? OK, good. At least a significant portion. The rest of you are just lying. Because we've all experienced it one way or another. Maybe not necessarily with the piece of paper, but we've all done it. So you go up, you get that little piece of paper where that gives you your number. Or if you're going to Passport Canada, you press a button, it spits out like a number. Different places do it differently. You get that piece of paper with that number. Nobody else gets to have that number because it's yours. Does that number actually mean anything? Other than your number is 62 until you're done. That number has no real world meaning other than it's to identify you. That is a surrogate key. Surrogate keys 
are the shit. It's the best. They're not shit. They are the shit. There's a difference in that phrase. Because a person could change their name, their SIN number, their gender, and their date of birth, and you'd still be able to find them. It never changes. You have to find it. It's assigned once, and it never changes again. It is permanent. You can never reuse it. You give somebody number 405, regardless of what happens to them, there will always be number 405. It has no meaning outside of the database server. They're always numeric, so that means they're fast. And more often they're hidden, for the most part. Like, you'll have places where the number shows up. Like, you go to Loblaws, you buy something, you get your receipt, and, you know, there's going to be a number on the receipt. That's a surrogate key. That number is being generated. You know, it's just going, usually, if you, you might not realize it, but a lot of those stores is, that number, even though it looks like a big number, it's actually um, company, store, branch, and then the the transact the data usually like batch number and then the actual transaction number so it's a combination of all those numbers so that the batch number is like you know it could be 254 which means like happening on 254th day of the year you know the store because loblaws for example is a bunch of stores right you got loblaws superstore independent uh zares and a couple of other things shoppers well, Shoppers actually uses a different system, but it's the same, it's the same idea. But all the grocery stores, Loblaws, their receipt, because Shoppers receipts look different than Loblaws, or at least they used to last time I was in there. But a Loblaws receipt, regardless of which branch of Loblaws, they all look the same, and they'll have the same receipt number style. And that is built up a bunch of different things. But that last part is a sorry key. It's just a number that goes up. So transaction one for the day, transaction two for the day, transaction three for the day. The numbers are meaningless to you. They don't mean anything to you, but they're easy ways of tracking the information. They're usually hidden because, you know, a lot of other things, you know, you go online and you've registered with, I don't know, Amazon. And you go to edit your profile. Nowhere on that page does it show you your customer number. It's there. It's hidden. But who cares? So it hides. Surrogate keys are often hidden from end users because they're meaningless. They, they don't need to know. Order number, receipt numbers are actually some of the rare exceptions to that rule. And even then, they're really meaningless to us. We just know that it's an order number. That's oh, This is the number I'm going to use to get my money back. It means nothing to us. We just know what it's for. So here's two examples of a rental property. If we weren't using a surrogate key and we wanted to identify a rental property, and pretending this is not an apartment building, this is just houses. If we weren't using a surrogate key, the only way we could find it is a combination of the city, the street, the city, the state or province, and the postal code. That's the only way we could actually uniquely identify it. It would be that combination. That's a compound key. If we added a surrogate key, we don't ever need to look at it by property ID. Um, I, eh? Yeah, that's actually the example I was about to use. As I say, for those of you that have tried, looked at buying a house and completely, we all realize that nobody can afford a house. I can't even afford a house anymore. If I sold my house, I can actually afford another house. That's how stupid it is, you know? So when you're driving around, sometimes you'll see house for sale and there'll be an, a number on the, on the for sale sign, an MLS number. That is a surrogate key in the MLS system, which for those that don't know what that is, it stands for Multiple Listing System, MLS, Real Estate System. And each property that goes up for sale is given a unique number in the MLS. And that's a surrogate key that allows you to find individual properties. So for those of you that are never going to buy a house, that's how you find a house to buy. <laughs> hey, I'm completely realistic about this. My daughter will live with me till I die. Uh, this I literally what I just finished talking about. So a composite key, I already described that too. So remember I was talking about how I'm going to be skipping slides? This is how I'm going to skipping slides. Foreign key. So foreign key is the next kind of key we need to think about. A foreign key defines the relationship between two objects in the database. And I'll be talking about this next week more. Um, so 
the key in a reference table is called the foreign key. The key in the referencing table is called the primary key. Often it's known as a parent-child relationship. A, the parent has a primary key, the child has a foreign key. The foreign key provides the link between the two tables and its value comes from another table. And so a foreign key is a single or a composite of columns. That is the primary key of another table. The reason why it's called a foreign key is because the value in that column comes from a source that is foreign to itself. Sounds like a complicated concept, but it's really not. Basically put, if we have a course list, so a class list, okay, so whatever, this section here, there'll be a series of student numbers in the class list. That student number is not defined by the class list, it's defined by the student. Therefore, the student number in the class list is a foreign key because its value comes from a source foreign to itself, it comes from something outside itself. Does that make it, make, make it a little more sense? That's why it's called a foreign key. So anything that is a foreign key, the value in the foreign key comes from somewhere outside of itself, usually usually, and preferably, the primary key another table. There's been cases I've seen foreign keys where it's not doing that and it's not a good time. But normally, a foreign key references the primary key of another table. And if the primary key of the other table is a compound key, the foreign key is also going to be a compound key. When you carry it across, the whole thing has to come. You can't refer to only part of the primary key of another table. You have to refer to the whole primary key of the other table, which, again, why we try to avoid compound keys or composite keys and we like using surrogate keys because it's just record number one is record number one. Um, looking at the bottom there, we have a department name, a budget code, an office number, and department phone. In the employee, we have an employee number, a last name, a first name, and a department. The department is being treated as a foreign key because the value of the employee's department comes from the primary key of department. Therefore, the value of department is foreign to the employee. You get hired at a new job and you're assigned to the R&D department. The fact that the R&D department is foreign to the fact that you're an employee, because it was there before you were there, it'll be there after you were there, It'll be there while you're there. It's a foreign entity. It's foreign to you as an employee because it is defined elsewhere. Thus, it's a foreign key. Okay, so I'm going to go. Oh, God, I hate. Now I'm going to. Here, I'm going to go back to that in a bit because that slide is going to show up again and again. So, this is another example of a student and courses. And in this case, we have a course ID on the student table. And the course ID is a foreign key that goes to the primary key of course, the course table. Um, this design is exceptionally stupid, just so you know. Can anybody tell me why it's such an exceptionally stupid design? I like using this example because it just points things out that are really dumb. It would be. And the fact the way it's designed right now, any given student can ever ever take one course. So they come in, they sign up, they get one course. They finish the course, they're done. They're not allowed to be a student anymore. So this design is exceptionally stupid. Yes, it'd be a many, many. Um, okay, so back to our, this, this is where I actually wanted to deal with this. So we've got the student table, the class table, and we got a grade table. So we got a, in here we got a student number, we got a class number. We have a bunch of grades. Right as it stands with the way this is made, is there any way to know whose grade it is or what class that grade is for? None, because we don't have any foreign keys. If we add in the student number and the class number, suddenly we know that Sam Cook took two courses. He took course uh, 10 and 40. 
and he got those two grades. So this is telling me that Sam Cook took Chem 101 and Accounting 101, uh, yeah, Accounting 101 in fall 2020. And they got the, he got the grade of 3.7 and 3.5. Because we added the foreign keys, we now know what the grade belongs to. And again, as far as the grade table is concerned, the value in the student number is defined by something outside itself. Therefore, that's why I'd say foreign key, because the value in here comes from a foreign source, the student. The class number comes from a foreign source. It comes from the class table. Therefore, these are foreign keys. And earlier you asked, how would I know when to use a compound key? There it is. This would be a compound key. So that <clears throat> Sam Cook can only take accounting 101 once. Realistically, if when you look at how they've designed this, um, you see you got Chem 101 Fall 2020, Fall 2020, and then Spring 2021 for Chem 102. In theory, we could do Chem 101 Winter 2020, and it would have actually have a different class number. So therefore, the student could take that class multiple times, but it would actually be a different entry because it's in a different term. This is a compound key. The combination of these two columns identifies the grade. Thus, it's two foreign keys participating as part of the primary key. And it's a con this slide shows every kind of key you can have in one slide. You got primary keys, you got foreign keys, you got a compound key. And the fact that this compound key, this primary key is made up of foreign keys at the same time. That's something you can do. So this slide shows every one of those things. When we get into more design, like more of the design stuff in the next week or two, we'll revisit some of these concepts. But that's what foreign keys do. It allows you to identify data in other tables by referring to their parents. Okay, how do you know when to use or not use a key? So there is a data scientist, his last name was Cod. I can't remember his first name. I was really hoping I was gonna remember it by the time I got to you guys, because I couldn't remember, hey? No, Boyce is another guy. <laughs> There's Boyce, Cod, and Chen. And I cannot, Merton Chen. I know Martin's first name, Merton. But the other two guys I can't remember. Those guys were around in the 70s. Like, you know, I was like that big. And I don't remember the 70s, obviously. The Cod defined, he was one of the big scientists behind the concept of relational math. And he defined a lot of the concepts that have to do with relations and relationships and that kind of thing. So his definition of the rows of a relation, also known as a table, must be unique. In other words, for it to be a valid table or relation, each row must be unique. However, there is no requirement to designate a primary key. So each row must be unique, but you don't necessarily need to have a primary key. But the fact that each row must be unique kind of implies you need a primary key. In the real world, like, you know, like anything not academia, every table has a primary key. End of story. Like, should you make a primary key? What is the answer? Yes. You shouldn't even go, uh, do I make a primary key? No, you don't even think that. Just just do it. Um, when do we designate the primary key? Usually you need some extra information, like you might not know it right away. So as part of the design process, that's when we figure out when we need more uh, information of the primary keys. Now we're gonna dive into relationships. So relationships have a phrase called relationship class. Remember earlier I talked about an entity class? Relationship class, we can just drop the word class. It's a relationship. It's an association between entities. So student, course, those are two entities. There's something that connects them. That's a relationship. A relationship instance is the connection between two specific rows of data or two instances. So you associated to CST 8215, 23 fall, section 340. That is an instance. And that instance exists what, 84 times in this room with a different student number, but the same course code. But those are separate instances of a relationship. 
It's each individual relationship. The relationship class just defines that, hey, there's a relationship between students and classes or courses. Let's go with the word courses since classes is on the slide. There's a relationship between students and courses. That's the class of the relationship. The instance is the individual actual relationship. A uh, relationship can involve two or more entities. Uh, I've seen some that involve 12, 13, 14 entities. Just really complicated data structures. That's just what it is. Um, there's degrees of relationship. So when two entities are related to each other, the binary relationship, when three entities are related to each other somehow, it's known as a ternary relationship. And then the data scientists gave up giving it names because they realized that you got unary, binary, ternary, and then slots. They just stopped after three. They just stopped giving it names after three. It's, it's just a thing. So an example of a binary relationship would be employee and skills. An employee can have many skills. A skill can be, a, a, can be used by many employees, but there's only a one-to-one -one relationship, not a one-to-one, -one, but there's only two entities involved in employees and skills. If we have a client with a project and an architect, so the client has a project that's being worked on by an architect, that's known as a ternary because there's three entities involved in that relationship. And then you'll have another one with four and they just don't have a name for it. A unary relationship, which we don't talk about on the slide, on these slides at all, which is kind of strange, is a relationship, it's, a, it's an entity related to itself. So it doesn't ever relate, it has a relationship, but it refers to itself. Um, usually used in trees. Uh, how many people in here remember Yahoo? Okay. Once upon a time, we didn't have things like Google. Before Google, we had indexes. And Yahoo was the index. So what would happen is there was categories for web pages. So every time you want to be categorized, you want your website to be found, you'd go to Yahoo and register your website. It didn't look for you. You went and advertised yourself. And you'd, you'd pick, you know, this is the parent category. So you'd have like, you know, shopping, and then you'd have like Walmart, and then, you know, and you'd dive into shopping, general stores, Walmart kind of thing. And it was a tree, and each of those is just a category that refers to the parent category. It's a unary relationship because it's all contained in the same tree. It's just, there's parents all the way up. Then you got binary and ternary. Okay. Um, so we're gonna be, that, that first line is really dumb uh, because we're about to talk about those things. So we're gonna talk about domain integrity, and integrity and referential integrity. The purpose of those kinds of three integrity constraints is to make sure the database is Integrity is safe, so in other words, the data doesn't get damaged or become pointless. We're going to start with domain in integrity. So domain integrity means that all the values of a column is the same kind of data. So if we have a column that's supposed to hold a date of birth, it should always hold, should it hold somebody's phone number? The fact that it always holds the same kind of information is known as a domain integrity rule. A phone number should not have a date in it. A person's last name should not have a phone number in it. Therefore, a column that has last names will usually have last names in it. Unless you're from India. Then there's a 50-50 chance you're going to have a last name. If you're an Algonquin and you're from India, you have a period as your last name. You laugh. If I look at the class list of this group, there's three people with just dots as their last name. Cool. But your first name will always have a first name. There's a value there. Um, that's domain integrity. So a first name would have a domain of first names such as Albert, Bruce, Kathy, blah, blah, blah. All the values of first name must come from names in that domain. Cool. Now, <clears throat> columns in different tables could have the same name but they might actually have different rules of domain integrity. Because in theory, you could have a couple of different tables, but you're always using the same column name. Like, let's say you have a table called shipping methods. 
it's a common called name. The values in there could be FedEx, UPS, uh, Intelcom, Amazon, whatever. That's the name of a carrier. That'd be the domain of that name. But then you look at another column for customer and they have a column called name, that'd be the name of a person. Even though you're using the same name, when that field is used in other tables, the domain might be different. Okay. And entity integrity constraint. It states that the primary key must be unique. And that's what makes the entity have integrity. So there's a unique column. It's unique for every row. It is not null. In other words, it must have value. That allows for inte entity integrity. And referential integrity refers to, excuse me, um, the values in a foreign key must exist somewhere else as the primary key of another table. The example I used with the last group is as this. Can you guys exist if your mother didn't pop you out? Think about it for a second. Can you exist if your mother did not exist? I didn't catch that. I don't even want to know what you just said. I, I, I got a funny feeling I really didn't want to hear that. I'm so glad I'm half deaf. <laughs> um, but... Technically, can you exist unless someone gave birth to you? We don't have people popping out of clone banks yet. So technically, the referential integrity for each of you is that the fact that there was someone to give birth to you at some point. Therefore, you cannot exist unless your mother existed. Therefore, that's referential integrity. If your mother didn't exist, neither would you. Okay. Technically, your dad too, but realistically, your dad had very little with to do with pushing you out. I'm just gonna call it the way it is. I mean, your dad worked for two minutes, so I, that's why I use the mother as the example. I warned you guys, I'm not always appropriate. I'm just gonna call it the way it is. Jesus, I I gotta cut that out of the video. <laughs> but anyways, but I'm just saying, you know, realistically, I could have used father, I could have used mother, but realistically, the mother is the good example because she's going to be there when you're pushed out, the father not necessarily. So things happen. That's referential integrity. It's the easiest way for me to explain it to you guys, and thanks to him, I was able to make it funny. And that's how it works. You cannot have a value in a foreign key unless it exists somewhere else as a key, as a primary key of another table. Uh, this is actually content really that's for going to be for next week. And these slides actually kind of make a dog's breakfast out of it, but I'm going to cover them very lightly before we're done for today. We're going to talk about cardinality. Cardinality means the count, and it's always expressed as a number. And this is one concept a lot of people have a hard time with. You have maximum cardinality. That's the maximum number that a relationship instance can participate. It ever has two values. One, many. That's the maximum participation. Either there's one or there's lots. When it means the maximum is one, it means it can ever be one. When there's a maximum, there can be many. Minimum cardinality means the minimum number of instances that can be that it must participate. And it also only has two values. Can anybody in this group get this one right? Because last group, they got it wrong. Can anybody guess what are the possible values for a minimum cardinality? If the maximum cardinality is one or more, what's the possible values for a minimum cardinality? Okay, I heard it from two different people. Somebody over here had said zero, and somebody there said one. Those are the two values, either zero or one. Zero means it's optional, one means it's mandatory. Zero means it's optional. In other words, you could be an employee with zero skills. Okay? But they don't know yet. They just hired you and they haven't realized that you don't know shit. So you have zero skills, but you exist. Therefore, as an employee, you can exist without any skills. 
So therefore, technically, your relationship to scales is 0 or 1, 1 or more. And this is a parent-child relationship, which I already used the example earlier. Um, so in a one-to-many relationship, because I'll be talking about tons of relation, the relationship details are going to be coming next week. But in a one-to-many relationship, the entity on the one side is always called the parent. The entity on the child side is always the many. So for example, if you think about a receipt from Loblaws, you have one receipt with one or more items in it. The relationship, the way it works, is it cannot be a receipt unless there's at least one item. And the item on the receipt can only ever belong to the one receipt. So the receipt can have many items. Each item on the receipt can only ever belong to one receipt. So this is a bit of how the cardinality works. Usually it's known as a has a relationship. In other words, an employee has one or more computers. A computer has one assigned employee. So you'll notice we'll use the word has a lot. Um, this is where I was saying earlier, the slides all go, go to takes a, takes a dog's breakfast. This is, this is where it's, the terminology is completely whack. Um, so there's three types of maximum cardinality, but realistically, we're going to talk about this as types of relationships next week. You have a one-to-one -one relationship, a one-to-many relationship, and a many-to-many -many relationship. And these are just maximum cardinality. So one-to-one -one means it's a one and one. One-to-many means it's one and many. And when it's many, it automatically assumes there's at least one, right? One or more. And then you got many to many, which means there could be many on both sides. And we're going to use this as our samples. So employee to badge, or for you guys, a student to a UPass or a student ID card. Each student can only ever have one UPass. Each UPass can only be associated to one student. Therefore, it's a one to one. An employee can have many computers. Each computer can belong to one employee. Thus, it's a many to many. There's a one on one side and a many on the other. There's actually more to it than that, which I'll be talking about that next week. And then you have a many to many relationship where an employee and skills is a many to many job because an employee could have many skills and those skills could actually be available to many employees. Um, I, at my day job, we have, whatever, 10 or 12 programmers, 10 or 12 developers. And out of this group, you know, 75% of them are C++ programmers. So they have C++, uh, MFC skills, you know, .NET, blah, blah, blah. But also C++ is assigned to multiple employees. But not all employees have C++. And C++ is also not tied to all employees. Therefore, it's a many-to-many -many relationship where the skills can be assigned to many employees, and each employee can be assigned to many skills, but not necessarily the same skills. For example, C++ will never be associated with me. Neither will C Sharp. PHP, Python, and Perl. This is my world. And SQL, JavaScript, HTML. I'm a web developer. I'm a web developer. Not a low-level driver. I don't write drivers. The other guys at work can write drivers. Not my job. Most of them can't even SQL their way out of a wet paper bag. So, you know, different skills. Okay, so that is where we're stopping today. Um, next week, we will be um, taking, we're going to be talking about conceptual diagramming and conceptual design. We will, the hybrid is being released to you guys for to do. For those of you that are getting up and not listening now, you might care for two or 30 seconds. The I'm releasing the hybrid to you guys on the weekend. You will have the week to do it. It's based on uh, hybrids week one and two, like the slide decks and the hybrid tasks. Week one, week two. That's what that quiz... I'm going to release it this weekend. Yeah, yeah. Eh? That's the quiz. I'll be linking it right in the announcement. No problem. So and that's about it. You should all be able to start working on lab two. It's been released. <laughs>